First up, um, what is Frame.io? We're a video review and collaboration platform. You can kind of think of us as an InVision for video. And we actually, uh, my co-founder and I started building Frame.io as an internal tool at my previous company. I owned a post-production company here in New York City that made all kinds of television commercials. Um, used to, I've, been part, I've been involved in over 100 digital shorts for Saturday Night Live and Super Bowl commercials and things like that. And we were just having challenges collaborating on the videos that we were making. So collaborating with vendors and clients and just each other. And the typical set of challenges that people have when they're working on video is, first, you have these huge video files and all sorts of people need access to them. Most people just tend to use file sharing services uh, to share them. So like Box, Dropbox, WeTransfer, just some means of shuttling files back and forth. But those services are all really bad when you want to view video online. So if you want to share work in progress and say, hey, here's the latest edit. What do you think? Do you have any notes? Is this approved? People then turn to mostly consumer video sites like Vimeo or YouTube. Um, they'll upload it, make it private, put a password on it, send a link in an email. And then you try to have these collaborative conversations in a static email on, about moving visual content. So it's conversations like, at one minute and 10 seconds in two frames, there's this thing happening in the upper right-hand corner that I don't like, and then that thing he says after that should come before the thing he said before, but oh, that bit we cut out last week, let's bring that part back in. Um, have you guys had these conversations? Anybody made video? Yeah, it's really, it's, it sucks. Um, you might be doing that conversation with five, 10 different people, and the video creation process is very iterative, so you don't just go through that process once, you go through it 10 times, 50 times, and you wind up with your media and your conversations spread out across all these different platforms. That was kind of the mishmash of different you know, services that we were using at Frame.io, uh, at my previous company, and, and like I said, it, just, it was really not a good experience. So we started looking around to, to see if there were other services that were better suited towards the type of work that we did, but everything we found was either really bad, really expensive, or both. In fact, most of them were both. So we decided to spend a couple months, we thought we'd build something very simple for ourselves um, that would solve our own problems. But as we started building it, we, we pretty quickly realized that you know, we weren't the only ones that felt this way, really everybody felt this way. And even outside of our vertical, we were kind of doing entertainment and advertising, but outside of that vertical, video is really becoming horizontal, right? It's the preferred way that people want to receive information on the internet, like these tasty videos. And thank you for BuzzFeed for being one of our customers. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it's sales teams and marketing teams and tech companies and education. So with that insight, we decided to branch it off as its own company and, and focus on it full time. That's how Frame.io came to be. You know, I think a lot of people are really surprised to, to learn the sort of very broad group of participants that are involved in the video creation process. A lot of people see Frame.io and they, say, they think, wow, that's, that's a really cool product for editors, for video editors. And it is, it's a phenomenal tool for video editors, but we're actually building a product for the business of creating video, which is much bigger than just the editors themselves. We bring all the participants together into one cohesive platform. But what I'm really here to talk to you about is three things. Uh, these are the three things that constitute our product design philosophy at Frame.io, and I believe these are also the three primary reasons that we won an Apple Design Award for our iOS application at this past WWDC. But first, how did we win this Apple Design Award? Logistically, how did it happen? A lot of people ask me this question. Did we have uh, you know, a cousin that went to school with Johnny Ives' uncle? Like, no, we didn't. Um, the answer I give is the same answer that I, that I give when people ask me, how did you guys raise money from all these VCs and celebrities? And the answer is, we built something extraordinary and then the rest was easy. And, um, oops. And for that reason, I believe that building a, a product-driven, uh, being product-driven is the best way to build a company because when the product wins, the customer wins, and when the customer wins, the business wins. And when you think about it, for a lot of companies, especially mobile apps, that app, that product, is literally the only way that your customers ever interact with you as a company, so it better be a great product. So what's our formula for being extraordinary? Well, let's be clear that first, you need to you need to execute the fundamentals well to build a winning product. So there's no shortcuts. You gotta have uh, a focus on the user. You have to solve actual customer problems and you need to achieve product market fit. But let's just assume that we've done all that. So I wanna talk about the three things that I believe drives our product success and sets us apart from the rest. So those three things are focus on the unimportant details, 
designed for magic moments, and start in high fidelity. So at Frame.io, pixel precision is not an enhancement. And this attention from the largest to tiniest detail represents our high standards for product. But I'll take it a step further. Details fucking matter. And we have this line in our employee onboarding document because it's something that we really drive home across our entire business. And I have two of our guys in the audience and they can attest that that line is in our employee onboarding document. But there's something that's more important than pixel precision and it's emotion. So details that add emotion to your product are often considered unimportant. But it's important to remember that customers are living, breathing, uh, imperfect emotional beings, and that doesn't vanish the second they pick up, your, pick up their phone and start using your app. So the best apps in the world make people feel something, and that's your job as a product designer to make them feel something. The unimportant details are something uh, that we understand really well in other creative mediums like writing, right? So it's not just about what you say, but how you say it. So consider this quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's a beautiful quote that makes you feel something, especially in our current political climate. But the message can be conveyed in a pure functional way, right? So a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. When you deliver the message, you deliver the same message, but the emotion of Margaret's quotes Li lives in the details, and that's what you connect with on a human level. So let me give you a product example. Uh, at fr in Frame.io, we have this very simple UX pattern. So you can see that we have project collaborators at the top of a, of a project, like most group chat apps would show, and tapping a collaborator would slide into a table view, right? So you could see the list of collaborators. Well, it could, but we thought about how could we say it differently, and we came up with a signature UX move that makes you feel something simply by changing how we say it. So instead of sliding into a table view, we can actually grab down to fluidly transform the UI into a table view. And you can go down slowly, and back up slowly, and down, and up. This is so fun to play with. Like, it feels amazing to play with, and I'd encourage you guys to download the app and play with it. So the content didn't change. The only thing that changed is how we presented it. And then we continue that fluidity by adding the subtle bounce as you scroll through your media. Okay, next, design for magic moments. So first we need to define what a magic moment is. A magic moment combines function with emotion. And magic moments are often, they're too often misunderstood, and that's, it's what really sets you apart from the run-of-the-mill applications. Magic moments inspire and win customers, why? Because it conveys thoughtfulness. It shows that you went the extra distance. Apple is the master of the magic moment. In fact, if you have just one magic moment, it'll make your customer assume that the rest of your product is just as great. They'll actually fill in the gaps all by, them, by themselves. You don't even have to market it to them. So let me give you an example of a magic moment in our application. So one of the primary value props of Frame.io is being able to easily communicate around video with time-stamped comments. So let's watch a video and crank up the audio if it's not up. All right, so cool video. This is, um, it's, a, it's a trailer of a, sh of a film called uh, View from a Blue Moon. It's a surf film. Uh, I'd encourage you guys to check it out. It's really cool. But so now we have a bunch of time-stamped comments that are beneath the video. And tapping on a comment is going to take you to that frame. So I'll select one comment, the next. All right, we're going through the video. Cool. Now the nature of time-stamped comments is they're time-sensitive. So consider this, this comment that we have selected says this cut, isn't, this cut isn't on the beat, it feels a little early. So that's something that you really want to kind of experience. You want to play it back a few times and sort of feel that out. But it would be really difficult to sort of scrub that area back and forth on a mobile device. So we came up with the idea of comment replay. When a comment cell is selected, a play symbol appears over the commenter's head, 
and pressing play will loop a, two a loop of four second range, two seconds before and two seconds after. The comment cell highlights on the frame where the comment was left. And the phone literally buzzes in your hand on that frame. You can literally feel the beat. So we executed this simply and we combined function with emotion to create a magic moment for the customer. So the very last thing I wanna to talk to you about is not product oriented, it's process oriented. And it's start with high fidelity. So I don't buy into the concept that UI and UX are separate. These things are intrinsically connected and the harmony between them is where the unimportant details and the magic moments really live. The visual design is going to inform the UX and vice versa. In our experience, wireframes are suitable for business process, not for product process. So when designing Frame.io, we work by immediately designing a finished product. We believe that high fidelity concepts help us build the best product the fastest, and seeing magic moments fleshed out sparks new creative ideas. It used to be expensive to create high fidelity, uh, high fidelity designs, but with modern tools like Sketch, it makes it, it makes it really easy to just immediately start building. So. That's product design at Frame.io, and thank you guys very much. Um, so the, I guess it would really be kind of three if you don't count the whole back-end team that, had the, that was building the API for a year and a half before that. But the actual iPhone app um, was one developer and one product designer and myself. Who are here tonight? Todd and Zaheer. I guess I'm taking more questions. Um, over here. Yes. Okay. Uh, so just jumping into high fidelity right away, which you see probably is somewhat controversial uh, strategy. How did you guys arrive at that? Yeah, I think it, there's there's a place for for wireframes. You know, if you're if you're an agency working with a with a client, I think it's a really good idea to wireframe before you jump into high fidelity. But when the you know when you have a small team like ours, um, you know, to me maybe it's just how how our brains work. But we just we just don't separate them from each other. It's um, it, it, the the create like we just don't have as many good ideas when we're doing wireframes, right? Like. And the thing is, is that we just, we have the ability to do these high fidelity designs very quickly, and it's not necessarily, they're not final, right? We continue to iterate on those high fidelity designs, but it's easy enough to, uh, you know, to throw some, some color and icons and different things to start feeling it. If you're building a house, you have to design a floor plan. But imagine you could just start, you know, building rooms and furniture and walls and colors and pictures. You can just, just do it really quickly, you would, you would, and your house would probably come out totally differently if you went through that process. So we feel like with design, we have the ability to do it, and so we do. Hi there. Um, I'd love to learn more about the users and how um, the early adopters have, or if they did shape their design process. Um, and that's just something very simple. Like how gross was that early adoption stage? Um, how did the outcry by those people that are interacting with your users and their online businesses? Yeah, it's a really good question. So. You know, we built Frame.io to solve our own problems and it was really built as a reflection of my previous company. And so we've, we've been really, really close to the problem for a long time. And so over the next, you know, kind of 12 to 24 months, we feel like we have a really clear idea of exactly what to build. And that's not to say we didn't talk to customers. We talked to customers constantly, but they more kind of reinforced what we were doing rather than sort of shape the direction of, of what we were doing. I think naturally as you know, we are now fully focused on building software and not on making videos that we're naturally gonna drift a little bit away from having our, our pulse on the, you know, our finger on the pulse of exactly what, what they need and we'll have to do more kind of, you know, traditional uh, product management, uh, talking to customers and things like that. But right now we, we are really, really clear on exactly what we need to build. Was the question, do we prototype? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, you know, when we were doing the iPhone app, we, uh, this first iPhone app, we didn't do a great deal of prototyping. We did some animation prototyping in After Effects because the animations were, were more complex, like the collaborator pull down. Uh, it was important to sort of flesh that out before, before uh, Todd started building it. Uh, now we are doing um, more prototyping. We're using Envision mostly. Um, we've used all the prototyping tools, but we've kind of been leaning towards Envision more recently. Oh yeah, so we don't only have an iPhone app. So we launched as a web application, and we have, um, we actually have uh, five clients. Uh, we, we've built a lot of stuff. We launched as a web application, we have the iPhone app, we have uh, two full clients that live within um, Adobe products, Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects. You have all the same collaboration tools available directly inside of those, and we, we have a desktop companion app that integrates with Final Cut Pro. So um, five pretty full-fledged clients. Thanks.